Good morning, church family. Thank you for tuning in. We have a great service for you today. Tim and Tanya Solomon are delivering the word. They're teaching on daughters, and it's encouraging, it's challenging. You are going to love it. God bless you and enjoy the service.
think of when Moses went up on the mountain and he came back and he saw the back of God through a crack and he glowed so much they had to put a veil over him. Do y'all remember that story in the Old Testament? Shekinah glory, that's right, Bob. And you know that, I, I love that he brought that up, Shekinah glory. There's a song that may be new to some of you, but I truly believe that the prayer of it is, God, we want to see your Shekinah glory, right? Overwhelm us with your presence. Like, staple our feet to the ground, right? And, until, God, we pay attention to what you would have to say and that we'd be obedient unto your word, right?
God, is that is who you are. You are a way maker. You are a promise keeper. God, we are so honored to, to be here to worship you. For you are the way maker. Lord, even when we don't feel it, you're there. Even when we don't see it, you're there. God, thank God we don't serve you because of a feeling. God, we walk by faith, not by sight. Touch each one of us. Strengthen us. It might be a moment that we are kicked down, but we are getting up again. God, we see you. We feel you. And even if we don't, you are still the I am. God, we thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, the strong son of God. Everybody said, amen. amen. You be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Well, Pastor Matt. You know, he, he said, hey, how would you let you speak on daughters? And I'm like, why would you pick me to speak on daughters? And then I started thinking about it. In my household, I have a wife, I have a daughter. On the weekends, my mom comes over, and then I have a female dog. So I have all this <laughs> estrogen. I need some testosterone. So sometimes I have to go out in my backyard. Our neighbor has a male dog, so the dog will come over. Unfortunately, it's a poodle, so it's, <laughs> I get very little help there. But you know, it, it's kind of, I'll, I'll go off script already. I knew it was gonna happen. But when uh, Tanya and myself, we got together, we got married, we ended up getting pregnant and we go to the ultrasound. Let's see what kind of you know, child we're having. Well, my sister already said you're having a girl. So we said, you know, so I'm, I'm convinced of it already. But we go there and they say, no, it's gonna be a boy boy. I said, wait a minute. I said, I don't like the image because, you know, now they have 3D, 4D, 5D. I mean, they got live versions inside there. <laughs> but back then, I mean, how many years ago? Nine, ten years ago? It was like, I'm not really sure. So Tanya says, let's go buy. We're not buying anything. We're not buying anything until they, we see another ultrasound. So we go back again because we had picked out a boy's name. His name was going to be um, Ethan Samuel. Ethan Samuel, but I wasn't buying it. I'm not, I'm not buying it. I feel, I feel like God is saying, you're having a girl. So we go back for the, the next round, and lo and behold, we have a little girl named Emma. So it was pretty awesome to see, see what happens. And what happens to a person whenever you have a daughter? You know, daughters change things. Last week we were talking about, like what, or a couple weeks ago, Pastor Kevin was talking about the value of every woman. No matter where you come from. Remember, he was talking about Esther being an orphan. Esther was a Jew. She was looked down on. But she had a purpose. God has a purpose for each and every individual woman. And then last week, Pastor Matt was talking about the wardrobe of a mother. How many different, you know, jobs, how many different hats do mothers wear? Especially now. I mean, look what's going on was around us. You know, now you're being not only mother, wife, school teacher, you're being everything to these, to these kids growing up too. So whenever Pastor Matt was talking about the words, the words that we sow into a person's life, the words that, that make or break a person. You know, Johnny Lingo, his example of the eight cow wife, he spoke words of life. You know, there's a, a Toby Mac song, Speak Life. And in that song, he talks about how vital words are to you. It says, hope can either live or die in just the power of your tongue, of how you see a person, of how you influence that person with the words that come out of your heart. Those words of affirmation, there's love languages. You know, I come from the mental health side and, and I always speak on love language. Everyone has a love language. And most of the time, I mean, there's not any time during when the test is given, I've never seen words of affirmation on the bottom. Words of affirmation are either middle and most of the time they're on the top because everybody likes some type of words of affirmation, of, of showing their value. And then on Wednesday night, we came in and Pastor Eddie was, spoken, was focusing on agape love. 
And what is agape love? It's that demonstrative love. So how can you demonstrate love to daughters? How can you tie that in and say, okay, we're going to focus, you know, we'll focus on Ruth a little bit later and, and how Ruth is going to show you that agape love. So as we tie things together, I'm going to introduce a wife, a daughter, and, and believe it or not, she is my Proverbs 31 woman. I have, I'm, I'm blessed. I have a mom who I believe is Proverbs 31 woman. I have a wife who's a Proverbs 31 woman. And I know eventually our daughter is going to turn into that. So without further ado, here's my beautiful wife. So I'm just going to take a few minutes to speak on mothers and daughters, and then I'm going to turn it back over to my husband. But, um, you know, it was interesting when Pastor Matt and Pastor Kevin asked us to do this. And I typically am not the speaker. I'm the singer, right? And so all week I mulled over different angles and different approaches. And yesterday I sat on the lanai and I began to pray because there's so much, right? But such a small amount of time. And the other thing is I'm not one that when I go someplace, I don't want to hear all this information that I can't digest. Give me one or two things that I can walk away and be applicable. So I am going to use a scripture from last week as the foundation, and it's Proverbs 31:25, And it says, she is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. And I'm going to use that scripture because I was fortunate enough to grow up in a home of a godly mother and a godly father. And so I have had the Proverbs 31 role modeled to me, right? So I have the opportunity today, today to speak from a daughter's point of view as well as a mother's point of view. And the reason that I chose this is I was reflecting on my home life, and it was a home life of joy, of peace, of um, happiness. And someone would probably say, well, oh, you must have had the Brady Bunch world. No, we had our trials. We, we fought, uh, you know, as siblings. My parents had challenges with us as we became teenagers. We had financial concerns. <laughs> But as I reflect, there was one thing that my mother always did. She handled life with prayer. And so I want to read Philippians 4, 6 through 7. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now, many of us often relate that scripture to anxiety or stress, which absolutely, it hits it on the head. But I want to highlight one phrase that says, let your request be made known to God. You cannot argue with me that there is not power in prayer. There is power in prayer. And that is one thing that my mother taught me is that there was power in prayer. All right. And I'm going to give two examples in scripture where someone sought the face of God and they actually changed God's mind. And I want to iterate, and I liked how Robert Morris framed it. He had said that God's character does not change because his character is perfect, but his mind can change. In Genesis chapter 18, 16 through 33, God's plan was to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you all remember this story? And Abraham went and bargained with him and said, God, would you kill this city and take the righteous people with it? And he, he bargained with God. He said, God, if there are 50 righteous, spare them. And God said, okay. And then Abraham, I loved it. He was like, Lord, just, just be patient with me. Let's do 45, right? And he kept working. He kept saying, God, God just be patient with me. And he got that, the God all the way down to 10, if he could find 10 righteous, right? And it showed that God softened his heart toward Abraham. Right? And I think about our children and how they come to us, right? And sometimes they are relentless, right? <laughs> but, but I love how God showed kindness and favor to Abraham. Another example where a man changed God's mind is Moses. In Exodus 32, 9 through 10, it said the Lord was on the edge of destroying the Israelites and starting over with, with Moses. But then it says, this is the verse, the Lord relented from harm, which he said he would do to his people. Yes, he changed his mind because Moses pleaded on behalf of the people. So going back to the Proverbs scripture that I mentioned, the reason she, my mother laughed at the days to come is she dealt with, with life through prayer, right? 
And so I think about if we can change or influence the Lord, that is a tool as a mother that we have to pray a hedge of protection over our children, to pray for their future mate, to pray for the relationships within their life. There were times that I remember my mother prayed for, for relationships to be broken because there were bad influences, right? She prayed for this man sitting here. Like she was worried I was never gonna get married. <laughs> and, and you know, God sent me a godly husband. Pastor Kevin had shared when he was in his mother's womb that his grandmother laid her hands on his mother's womb and, and prayed that he would become a pastor. Do you think that that prayer influenced the Lord? I do believe so. I mean, you can't, you can't dispute somebody's testimony, right? So not only is it a powerful tool as a parent, but there's one other thing I will leave you with. As mothers, as godly elders in the church, the greatest thing that we can teach our children is how to pray a prayer on the word of God. Because if we teach them that, they can deal with anything in life that comes their way. So that is my uh, portion of daughters and mothers, and I'm going to turn it back over to my husband. Thank you. You know, along that same line, you know, I was talking earlier about having a, a child. We went to the doctor's visit, and the day we were doing a checkup, they said, guess what, you're having a baby today. It's like, what? We're not due for another, what, three weeks or so? Well, we had no, no fluid in, in the baby, it, you know, it was kind of a scary thing, but they said, you drive to the hospital, and she sent me home to pick up the stuff, we go there, she has a C-section, baby comes out, blue. I seen a Smurf come out, and that was, freaked me out, they ran her off. And she was in the hospital for like three weeks, you know. So during that time, we were able, you know, people have baby dedications, so we dedicated her right there. And it was such an awesome experience to see how God just allowed us peace. We're a new parent. We have no idea what's going on. But that daughter and, he, and the power of prayer, it just, it changes everything. That was a, a great point in life is how prayer does change everything. I was told you I was going to talk a little about uh, Ruth and Naomi, a biblical look at a mother-daughter relationship. And as we speak about mothers and daughters, you know, well, I'm not a mother. You know, I'm not a biological mother. Well, here we're going to see a mother-in-law relationship. And a lot of times there is so many women in the church through the years who never had children, but who are such mother role models who have taken young, moldable lives and, and pointing them toward the Lord and, and just how to live in, in society today. So if you're not a biological mother, if you're a sister, if you're a, if everyone's a, you know, all females are a daughter, but you can see how you can change people's lives. You influence them in so many ways. Let's take a look in, in Ruth chapter one. We'll start it. Well, we'll see that Ruth, Ruth and Naomi, Naomi's husband passed away. Uh, the Naomi and, and Orpah had, was married to Naomi's sons. They both died. So now we come to a place where Naomi's going to do what's best for the daughters. In verse number eight, it says, Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud. And they said to, her, said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could, who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Right now we're seeing this relationship has been developed over the years. You know, they've had it from the beginning. And, and now... When it, when it comes down to it, they want to do what's best for each other. It's not just, okay, what's in it for me? In verse 14, we keep going and it says, And this they wept aloud. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Here's one point I want to make. Every daughter is unique. Every daughter is different. I have a, a mentor, Dr. Michael Grogan. And I was talking to him this week and I said, if there's one thing that you could pass along about impactful, about raising daughters, what would you say? 
And he said, well, you know, I have two daughters. The first one came out perfect, compliant, not a problem. Should have stopped it. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> but he said it was everything was great. He said the next one, nothing changed in the household. They still had a loving relationship, still had a godly home, but she was defiant. So he said, if I could tell you one thing, every child is unique. Every daughter is unique. Do not try to make them something they're not. Do not raise them the same way. Love them the same way. Love them the same amount, but you have to mold them. You have to be into a place where you can individualize your, your feelings, your emotions, and, and have them come up into a way that, that, that is pleasing, but it, it takes time and it takes effort. So with that along the way, we see here that, that the Orpha, she's, she's kissed her, her mother-in-law and said goodbye. She's gone with, with the Naomi's blessing. But Ruth says, I'm going to cling to you. Your God's going to be my God. Your people, my people. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Again, every daughter is unique. So the most important lesson in raising daughters is developing this relationship, developing that, developing that, that community, that the passion that you have for raising a daughter and wanting to teach them the right ways to go. And, and as you develop during your relationship along the line, it becomes evident that you want the best for her. Naomi and Ruth have, have, you know, I have this chart set up here where we can see how Naomi had nothing to offer. She's telling Ruth, go, be happy, go find a husband, move on. I want what's best for you because I have nothing to offer. And Ruth is saying, you know what, I'm loyal to you. I've been loyal to you since I met your, your son and I married your son. I'm staying lo loyal to you. Then Naomi says, you know what? If you're going to stick around, I'm going to sow into your life. It takes time. It takes effort. But if we see through the rest of the story in the, in the book of Ruth, this agape love that's been developed, it's been demonstrated, as Pastor Eddie said Wednesday, it's been demonstrated through her life. This is not what's best for me. It's what's best for you. We look at the other person. We want what's best for them as they move along. So throughout the book, we see the relationship even going to another level. It was already there at one time, but now it's going to that higher level. It's the, the selfless level. And what is, what is in a successful relationship? You know, I do a, a lot of marriage counseling, and the two pillars of marriage counseling are trust and commitment. If you have trust and commitment, and you're building the foundation of Christ, but those pillars are going to hold that relationship together. We see in this with Naomi and Ruth. It was trust and it was commitment. Naomi is going to sow into Ruth's life day in and day out. Naomi keeps coming back through the whole book and saying, okay, this is what's happening. I'm out in the field. Boaz is there. She's directing her along the line. She's giving her that words of wisdom, that vital information that she needs to, to go to the next level. And so many kids today, so many children are looking for someone just to help point them in the right direction. Someone does to come in and say, you know what? Here's that little added extra. I need, I need your wisdom. I need your guidance. And so that's what Naomi is doing here. She's giving her, uh, Ruth this wisdom along the way because Ruth trusted Naomi. And if you trust someone and you're committed to them, obedience is going to be easy. Obedience is going to be like, okay, what do you say? I know you know what's best for me. I know what you want, what's best for me. So I'm going to obey. And then what happens as the result of this true relationship, it's beneficial to both. It's reciprocal. It's not a one-sided relationship. And so daughters who are raised in this way, you know, when do you start raising daughters to be godly, to be respectful, to, be, to have manners? You start as soon as possible. You know, you, you, you start from the ground up and they see it modeled in people's lives around them. Sometimes they don't see it in their home. Sometimes they need to look outside their home. So it's up to us 
to raise daughters in a way that's, that, that shows them that there's some validity, that there's some importance to having manners, to having to, to being respectful to your elders. You know, if you're showing respect to teachers and things, it's only a natural to become respectful to God and his word. His word is, is there. We have the ultimate, you know, father in, in God himself. We're going to look a little bit about dads because I can look at daughters from the dad side. And then we'll look at it from a biblical perspective. But to sum this up with here, whenever, whenever there's a relationship between a mother and a daughter, it becomes easy if, if they both have their motives in the right place. It always comes back to your heart's motives. God looks at the heart. We should look at the heart. Actions are going <laughs> to... I've seen it in my own household. When two women are exactly the same, you know what happens? And I look back and I laugh. I chuckle. My wife comes in. She's all frustrated. My daughter's frustrated. And I have to chuckle because they are exactly the same. And then I look at me and I go, oh... They're exactly the same. <laughs> Pray for me. <laughs> but dads, let's talk about dads for a little bit. Dads, you're going to make a difference in their life. Uh, James Dobson, I got a lot of quotes from James Dobson, uh, a Christian psychologist throughout many years. I've been listening to him for probably 30 years and one thing that he was saying is, you know, be careful. If you're a man, be careful because your daughter is looking for someone just like you. When I have marriage counselor, you know, coming in marriage counseling and, and the dad's sitting over there and I tell them that statement. I said, how you treat your wife is how your daughter is going to want to be treated. So watch what, how you treat them. It, it's, it becomes, it's kind of scary sometimes because even in a, in a positive way, it's awesome to see a relationship like that. But if it's a negative relationship and daughters will, will be gravitate toward a male in that same role, it's, it, it's kind of scary. I have a, one of my best friends from, from, wow, from first grade, so it's been a while. His daughter just got engaged. And we were talking about it because I'm looking at the guy. I'm looking at a picture on Facebook and I'm hearing all the things they're talking about him. You know, he was in the military. He was this, this, this. And I looked, I, I was talking to him. I said, she's marrying you. He goes, I know. Isn't that scary? I said, yes, <laughs> it's scary. And I'm hoping that it's all the good stuff of him and the bad stuff drops off. But it's like, she went out. I don't think she was looking for someone exactly like him, but she found someone just like him. So, daughter, so dads, be careful because your daughter's looking for someone just like you. A dad and daughter relationship, it sets up the stage for future romantic involvement. Her attitude toward men is being shaped quietly each and every day because she's watching you. She's watching how you react to situations. She's watching how you interact with your wife. She's watching how you interact with society, with women in general. You need to respect women all over for your daughter to see that because it's, it's going to come back. It's going to come back to you. If her father sees her as beautiful and feminine, she will likely see herself that way too. Those words of affirmation. But if, you've, if, if a father finds her unattractive or uninteresting, guess what? She's going to have low self-esteem. It's going to follow her through days of her life. You know, a lot of times in counseling, again, I go back to the parents and I ask them about their relationship. You know, and, and so many times it is so vital. You see what was happening in, in the early relationships and how it's affected them through their adulthood. We raise our daughters with love and respect. That's the ultimate thing. We wanna treat them as the eight cow wife. We wanna treat them as a, as, a, as a wife who is a wife, a daughter, a person in society itself. We wanna build them up into a place where it's just, it's a natural for them to accept it. A lot of times, You don't even want to accept a compliment. When I see that in, in the office, it's like not even accepting a compliment. You, can't even, you don't know what value you have. Just like Pastor Kevin said way back, you know, it's like you have value. Everyone has that value. And it's up to us to help to, to enhance it and to let people know you are here for a specific purpose. You have a purpose in life. Growing up again with our daughter, 
from the get go, we had a, a not a poster, but what, what's that thing called? A sticker? <laughs> Whatever. An emblem on the wall, it said, daughter of a king. And we wanted our daughter to know from day one, she's a daughter of a king. She is royalty. You know, she, she always jokes around because our last name's Solomon. She goes, are we in relation to King Solomon? So we do all this stuff. And I said, honey, you are royalty. You're a daughter of the king. So how do we develop that relationship? How do we keep them going? Spend time with your daughters. Spend time, if you don't have a daughter, but you can be an influence to someone, spend time with them. I know we have daughter date nights. It's been a while. She's been talking about going back on a, she is so excited about a daughter date night. We go to, uh, what's that, two meatballs? Two, two meatballs in the kitchen. We'll go there and she loves that place. Then she wants to go to, um, yeah, Sky Zone. She wants to go to Sky Zone then, and then she wants to go see a movie. She wants to do like everything in one day. Dad day, we're gonna do it. And I'm like, okay, I'm not a ninja warrior anymore. She has me at Sky Zone climbing these, blowing out my Achilles on a <laughs> warp wall and everything else, but I'll do it. I'll do whatever I can. Because you know what? She thinks I'm invincible. She thinks I can do anything, and I try it. <laughs> it's not pretty sometimes, but I try it. <laughs> You know, from the get-go, daughters have their, you know, dad wrapped around their finger. We all know that. And so it's, it's amazing to see. But she respects me when it comes to discipline. And Tanya had pointed that out to me yesterday. She goes, you know, when it talks about, you know, disciplined children, it doesn't mention mothers. It mentions fathers doing the discipline. And I'm thinking, well, it kind of makes sense because whenever discipline happens, Tanya's voice is different than my voice. She listens differently when it's coming from a male side. So males have a, a, a special purpose in a life of, of just raising daughters. One last story, I told my daughter that I was gonna keep telling stories about her and last night she was, she was all freaking out. She's out in the truck now listening so I'm hoping she's hearing this. But you know how daughters, dad, daughters always want to marry their dads, you know. So I said, I'm gonna try this out. So the other day, she's always telling me I get married. I said, hey, you wanna marry me? And she goes, no. <laughs> and I'm like, first thing I thought of was like, wow, that, that's a crush to the spirit. And then she paused and she goes, that's not right, daddy. I said, why not? She goes, you're already married. So that made me feel better because she was at least <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> so I was like, Phew. So everyone has the opportunity to sow in lives, to sow in, their, in daughters' lives. Mothers, mother, fathers, significant adults, whoever you are, you have, you have a, a chance to sow into a young person's life. And remember, every daughter is unique. Every daughter needs to, to, to get to a place where it's like, okay, I know I'm unique. I know what you're saying is true, and I want to live it out. So how do you do You learn their love language. Find out what their love language is. If it's words of affirmation, if it's acts of service, if it's quality time. Boy, that's our daughter's love language, quality time. And to nurture that relationship. It takes time and it takes effort. Come out of your comfort zone and, and go in and, and nurture that relationship. And then the last thing I'm gonna leave with you is what Tanya said, is pray. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is effective. Uh, I was looking through some things and, and talked about a mother, referring to a mother, said the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Well, there's a, a Christian song back from the early 90s that said, prayer moves the hand that moves the world. God will listen to your prayers. God wants you to cry out. God knows what's going on, but he wants us to express. He wants that relationship with us just like we need to have a relationship with each other. We need to to make sure that above all other things, if you do nothing else, point your daughters to a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's the foundation. And when he's the foundation and we're living in the right relationship with him, all these other things will kind of fall into place. We still have to do the practical, but he'll do the, the miraculous. He'll do the supernatural if we allow them to. Make sense? Yeah. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for just how faithful you are in our lives, how good you are. 
and how you listen to when we pray, when we call out to you. You want that relationship that we have. You want that relationship to become real and genuine. Allow us, God, to be the men and women who raise this next generation, who, who bring daughters up to, to know that they are loved, to know that they are special, to know that they are unique, to know that they are, have a purpose in life. Lord, no matter where they come from, no matter if they're a nester, being an orphan, no matter if they've come from a, from a high place, you have a specific purpose. Allow them to see that. Allow them to feel your love. Allow them to know that you are real. And first and foremost, God, allow them to experience that relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. And we just give you praise and thanks this morning. And we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Great word, huh? Good stuff. I, I hope you enjoyed the, the series we've been doing the last three weeks with the uh, women, with the moms, with the daughters today. Uh, please know that we, you, we want to bless you. We want to honor you in everything, everything you do. I mean, what a challenging word how it is for us to know that our daughters, whether, whether it be in the children's church or at a school or anything like that, they are watching us. They're going to mimic us. They're going to act like us. And it's not until we have kids when we realize, oh dear, I said that. <laughs> it's amazing how bad something sounds or looks when our kids do the exact same thing we do. Right. May that challenge you. May it challenge you as a parent, as a leader, as a, as a, as a teacher. As a, may that challenge all of us. That everything we say and do, our kids are going to do. Guys, men, our daughters are going to look at us. That's who I want to marry. That could scare you. Or that could excite you. And hopefully it challenges you. But we love you. We appreciate you. Uh, be blessed. Have a great week. Remember, we have class uh, uh, class this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Pastor Kevin's going to be here teaching the Word of God again at 1 Corinthians. Uh, be blessed. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. Amen.